Welcome to this U.S. history presentation on the Second Industrial Revolution. This is continuing our look in the history of America during the Gilded Age, and we'll be focusing our attention in this particular lecture on technological and industrial change that transforms the American economy after the Civil War. Our target is 5.01. America is in a second industrial revolution after 1865. Second implies that there is a, you're right, first. In the first one we already looked at when the North began industrializing um, after the War of 1812. It was small, slow, factories were beginning, but they were not anything like the size of factories we think today. Some of them were no bigger than 10 foot by 10 foot. But that was a beginning nonetheless. And it was an era of technological innovation with the cotton gin, um, interchangeable parts, the sewing machine, and a host of other things that Americans uh, came to take for granted by the time the Civil War was over. So if there's a first industrial revolution and a second industrial revolution, what's the difference? And um, should they actually be two or should we just see them as one long industrial revolution? These are certainly important questions. However, there's one thing that we can say clearly and unequivocally that the United States, no matter how you describe these revolutions, is the world's leading industrial nation by 1920. The U.S. is on top of industrial production in the world. And it's our job to figure out how the U.S. got there. What are the factors that made this possible? So I have a causes and effects chart for the Industrial Revolution. So we're going to put in the center of the chart the second Industrial Revolution. It's our event. And now let's put some causes on our chart. Our first cause is abundant natural resources. America takes off industrially because it has resources, water, coal, oil, gold, silver, copper, iron. You need resources in order to have an industrial revolution. You need raw materials that you can turn into manufactured goods. Second of the causes, the United States government after the Civil War is very much in favor of business. The US government takes positions, engages in actions and passes laws that make America a pro-business climate. It encourages business growth, it supports business growth. Third, the United States has a large supply of labor. You can't make things without people doing the work. So we have a lot of people willing to work and we're getting more millions of immigrants after the Civil War increase the labor supply. Take these three things together and you've got the makings of an industrial revolution. Now let's look at some effects. One effect is labor conflict. There had been labor conflict before in the United States before um, the Second Industrial Revolution, but labor conflict will increase dramatically as working conditions get worse and worse. Workers fight back. A second effect, environmental destruction. Americans think they will never run out of resources and so they mine the heck out of the West. They chop down all the trees that they can. Um, they dig up all the coal. Whatever resource they want, they go for it. 
and that leaves a lot of destruction of the environment. And then the manufacturing itself also pollutes the environment. A good example is a river near Cleveland. Um, there is a river near the city of Cleveland which became full of waste products, petroleum, chemicals, wood, and this little river would actually catch on fire because of the amount of pollution that was in it. Third, urbanization. The increase in industry and the increase in factories helps grow cities. Cities get bigger after the Civil War, particularly you know, places like New York, Chicago. And last, the growth of monopolies. After the Civil War, we see companies bigger than anything that have ever has ever existed in American history before. These companies are monopolies. They dominate the markets. There's one monopoly um, over oil that owns 90% of all oil production in the United States. There's a sugar monopoly that controls 98% of all sugar manufacturing in the United States. These companies are so big they're even bigger and wealthier than the US government. So you can see from the chart, a few causes come together to create industrial revolution, and then the effects are enormous on American life. We would not have the American life that we have today without this industrial revolution, from the fact of cities and transportation right down to our uh, comfort, and sometimes discomfort with very large corporations, and even today still conflict with labor and debates over what we're doing to our environment. So monopoly, let's talk for a minute about that idea. Americans had seen some pretty wealthy people before the Civil War, but nothing like after the Civil War. And the idea of robber barons, monopolists, extremely wealthy corporate leaders took off and became a game that um, was uh, created in the late 19th century that became the basis of, of a, the game Monopoly that we all know today. And look what it's on it. There's railroads on it. Um, there's property because, you know, buying and selling property is how you make money. Waterworks. Um, the electric company, all these things would have been familiar to Americans as the way to riches. What this monopoly board is missing is things like oil and iron, um, the resources that monopolists used to get their wealth. Let's take a minute and look at monopolies. When you have to like get right down to defining a monopoly, it's when a business controls the entire market of a product. What do we mean entire market of a product? Meaning that that business dominates the buying and selling of that product and the resources going to make that product. If you own 90% of all oil production in the US, you're a monopoly. If you owned 80 or 70 or 60, you'd still be a monopoly. You'd still be greater than 50. When you're getting down to 50% of the market, you're getting less and less monopolistic, but you're still powerful. So when you think about a monopoly, think about when one company or business um, dominates a market for a product. Now, a question we often get, um, and it's it's a difficult question, difficult question to answer because you have to decide what the words mean. Are monopolies bad? Americans have debated this question for a long time. On one hand, a lot of people have argued that monopolies are hurtful. They hurt consumer choice. 
if you want to buy a product and you can only buy it from one company, then you are, you know, lacking choice in picking something else um, that you might like better. So in that way, consumers lose choice when there is a monopoly of a product. Monopolies can also be hurtful in that they discourage competition. Competition tends to lower prices and provides you with a better deal than someone else could provide you. And so for a consumer, losing choice and losing the possibility of a better price is hurtful to you. We could also argue that monopolies stop innovation, that if you control the entire market, there's really no need to make other products, no need to create new things, because who cares? People are going to buy from you because they don't really have a choice. A lot of the arguments for monopoly have been focused on the idea that a monopoly is a powerful company and why should we interfere with it doing its job very well? Some people say it's the law of nature. A monopoly is strong and the strong survive. If you're a weaker company, then you just simply get eliminated. And so having monopolies, it for some folks, drives out inferior businesses and it leaves the market to be controlled by the best company, the strongest company. So depending on what you see as good or bad about monopolies can shape the arguments you make about them and whether or not you think they do good for Americans or not. Let's talk about some major companies um, and resources involved in creating monopolies. Um, you need to have a source of energy and a, and, a, and a material that you can use to construct your monopoly. And there are three products in particular that are important after the Civil War. One is oil, which uh, the invention of steam engine drilling helps to increase the supply of oil um, for fueling um, economic growth. One is steel, which how else are you going to build a machine or a, a building or a factory? Um, you could build your factory out of bricks. Uh, you could make your machine out of wood. But why would you want to do that when steel provides a stronger, more durable product? And a third is coal, which increased mining of coal will supply factories with the power they need to make their products. Here's a picture of uh, one of the leading early oil producers, Edwin Drake, and his oil derrick. Now you might find it surprising to note that this all started in Pennsylvania, not Texas or Oklahoma. Um, Pennsylvania and Ohio, um, as well as some other states, have significant deposits, or did, of oil and natural gas. And so the earliest of these operations were in our backyard, not down in Texas or in the Gulf of Mexico. So we can see these things coming together. What's fueling this factory? Is it coal? What's lubricating the engine parts? Is it oil? What's the factory made of? Bricks and steel? What about these ships? Um, what about this train here? All of those things come together to help the growth of American industry. But you can see there is a definite byproduct of that. Look at what's coming out of the smokestacks. Think about what that's doing to the air quality of people. Think about what that's doing to the buildup of greenhouse gases, trapping carbon emissions in warming the earth. The folks at this time didn't really understand that. They felt like Earth would just keep renewing itself and it'd all be fine. But we will figure out eventually that this kind of a world is deadly, environmentally deadly. 
Let's talk for a minute about one of the ways that the U.S. government helped support big business in this time period, and that's through patents, P-A-T-E-N-T. A patent is a legal right to make and sell your invention because you register it with the government as yours and nobody else can steal it or copy it. Patents enable people to create new technologies, make money off of them, and those new technologies change America. After the Civil War, we get things like barbed wire. Um, just before the Civil War, the passenger elevator, the refrigerated railroad car, light bulbs, telephones. These innovations are patented and that makes money for the inventor. Look at the growth in patents as people are coming up with new technologies after the Civil War. A few under 100,000 in 1860, 1869, almost to 150, and then over 200, and then 250, and then 350,000 by 1910. So what's the long-term impact of this technology on America besides giving us new industries? One impact that you might not have thought of would be women working. Women had always worked in America, whether that's in the home or producing farm goods or sewing um, or working in fa early factories in New England. Women had worked for a long time. Um, in America, but new ways of women joining the workforce appear after the Civil War. One invention that does that is the typewriter. To type documents rather than having to handwrite them, women uh, enter the workforce as secretaries. Um, and so they are allowed to do things um, in business that once, you know, in an earlier time, probably would not have been a common job for them. There is an increased consumption of factory-made products rather than handmade products or locally made products. So people are buying things that were made in a factory that looks just like the thousands of other copies of that thing made in the factory. And Last but not least, the use of machinery has a tendency to devalue human labor and skill. The more that you can make factories run by machines, the more that people are simply pulling levers and punching buttons, it devalues the skill needed to make a product. Think about how much knowledge it takes to make a cabinet by hand, start to finish, versus making cheap furniture on an assembly line.